The Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 7, is where our text will be this morning for our sermon entitled, I Believe. Matthew 7, and starting at verse 24. This is the word of the Lord. Everyone who then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it is it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And herein ends the reading of God's word. Uh, Now, uh, I guess I was going to put that up there on the Bible in the sky, uh, so I didn't have that up there then, but that's all right. Uh, The first thing I want to talk to you this morning is, uh, I want to ask the question, what do we mean when we say, I believe in the Apostles' Creed? In the current use of the word belief, we tend to use it as if it is just simply a matter of opinion. And that is one of its definitions. And what I mean is, you have your belief, I have my belief, right? That's the way we often talk. Now, uh, I'll give you an example of this. Um, my friend Blair, uh, he, he texted me and said, hey, do you want to go see Star Wars this weekend? And I said, sure, yeah. I, I believed it would be a good thing for Blair and I to get together and to go watch Star Wars. And so he brought his mother and I brought Lucas. And um, he's really the only other Star Wars fan in the house. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so we, we went... We believe it would be a good thing to get together and and go see that. We also believe it would be a good idea to go to Rockefeller's and um, have food. And uh, so we did. Rockefeller's is a sports bar with excellent burgers uh, over uh, over in Sarver, over by um, the theater. Uh, Oh, some of the best burgers I have ever had. And uh, we were reading the menu, and I, my, Blair is my friend, and I trust him. And uh, he, said, he, he recommended a burger there um, that is called the Mad Cow Challenge. And um, I believe Blair. I trust Blair. And so I decided, okay, why not? I read the description, and I believed it'll be all right. I can do this. Now let me give you the description of the Mad Cow Challenge. The Mad Cow Challenge, it is a burger unlike any other. This burger reaches a level on the Scoville heat index at higher than 1 million. Our famous half pound patty blackened with ghost pepper rub and topped with sauteed jalapeno and habanero peppers smothered in ghost pepper jack cheese and finished with an insanely hot mayo served with a side of ghost chili fries. This is no easy accomplishment. Now, I believed that it would be okay. I believed I could finish this burger. Well, I found out I was severely wrong. My beliefs were wrong. I made it halfway through that burger and halfway through those fries before my lips were numb. I was crying. Uh, My throat was just, I couldn't feel anything. And my stomach started to say, how dare you? Why would you do this to me? And I was confirmed that that was wrong a little bit later when we went to the movie theater and I was, uh, Lucas and Lucas said I had to go to the bathroom, went to the bathroom and my stomach was just angry. I mean, it was just in pain. And uh, then um, this morning after I woke up and I got around and my body started doing its normal daily operations, um, I'll leave it up to your imagination. I was confirmed in my belief that I made a bad decision last night. But in each of these cases of the word belief, we're made, it's, it's not much different than an opinion. It's something that's up to, you know, it's, it's up to scrutiny. It's up to, you know, whatever. It may change. It may not. Belief in the Bible is a much stronger concept than what we typically use it for. Now, there is a minor difference between the primary meaning of the word belief in the English and the Greek word used in the Bible. A belief, according to Merriam-Webster Online, is a state or habit of mind in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or thing. See, it's confidence or trust in some person or thing, and it's a state or a habit of mind. This should not be something that's easy, easily subjected to change. It's rooted in absolute truth. It's absolute in truth that we've tested it. It's proved valid. And that's the way it is. That's the way scripture uses it. 
Okay? And it's relational because it's confidence and trust in something. It's something that I am willing to, to dig down deep and ground and root on this belief, this thing. Now, belief is closely connected to the word faith. They are kind of like two sides of the same coin. A belief is the content side of faith. It is the revealed truth of Scripture that makes up Christian belief. That's why I say when somebody says, I believe God is like, you better give me chapter and verse. Because our propensity is to what? Our, our habit is to go into idolatry. When we say, I believe without confirming the truth in Scripture, how do you know what you believe? Our authority is the Word of God. That's it. Not a person, not even a pastor, not a theologian, not a scholar, not a Bible teacher. It is the Word of God that is our authority. Okay? The Word of God. Now, the Word of God makes up the content side of our belief. It's, or, I mean, a belief is the content side of faith. We believe uh, because, um, because it's made up of the Word of God. That's what our belief comes from. It's rooted in, it's grounded on. Faith, on the other hand, is the action side of belief. Okay, you can't have one without the other. You can, if you divide them, then you end up in all kinds of problems, all kinds of heresy, right? Um, but just continuing on, faith, on the other hand, is the action side of faith. Faith is acting upon revealed truth. So belief without action is useless. Faith without content is dangerous, right? Belief without action is useless. Why? Because what does it say in the, in the book of James? It says, that, oh, you believe that there is one God? Good. But so do the demons. So do the devils. They believe and they shudder. See, their belief does them no good because it's a belief without faith. It's a belief that's not, that has no action. It's a belief that doesn't live in consistency with that. No, instead they have great orthodoxy, but it's useless because it doesn't save them. But what about faith? Faith without content is dangerous, I say. Why? Because if you have faith without being grounded in biblical content, that is where heresy comes from. That's dangerous. You're not substantiating your beliefs in the Word of God. You're just believing whatever you want. This is called enthusiasm historically in the church. It's just, I believe this because that's what I believe. I've had revelation from heaven, or it's just what I come up with in my own head, or whatever. That seems to be the order of the day today, isn't it? You have either you have dead orthodoxy on one side, a faith that doesn't change you, and on the other hand, you have faith that has nothing to control it, nothing to determine what is true and what is absolute. You have the New Age movement, you have you know, all this crazy stuff around us that just doesn't make sense. So the faith without content is dangerous. Belief without, act, uh, without action is useless. True biblical faith could be called belief in action. That's a faith. That's what that's what true biblical faith is. It, it is a it is belief in action. It is our rooted and grounded in the word of God, but is something that transforms us, changes us and we live it. OK, so when we say I believe in the Apostles Creed, we must understand that we are af we are affirming a revealed truth and committing to act upon it as well. This is not, when we read the Apostles' Creed, it is not just bare bones, you ha I believe this and that's it. No, it's a truth that I believe in and the whole tenor of my life lives in it. In preparation for the beginning of our new series on firm foundations, I've chosen to preach from Matthew 7, 24 to 27, because it deals with the subject of belief, and, uh, and, and so uh, that's, that's uh, why I chose it, I guess. <laughs> um, now, just a word on context. Again, you have this chart um, that is in, um, on the back of your, uh, your outline. And uh, the purpose is because it, it kind of helps us see the context of where this falls in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Um, so Matthew 7 serves as sort of a conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Jesus is wrapping up his sermon uh, that began in Matthew 5, 3. Jesus has been preaching what has been called the Kingdom Manifesto. I like that name. The Kingdom Manifesto. In this sermon, he has dealt with diverse topics and themes related to what kingdom life is like. He is not saying, okay, because so many people, they read the Kingdom, the, the, they read the, the Sermon on the Mount, and they think that this is like some, like, if you do this, you will be saved. No. That's heresy. 
You can do nothing to be saved. You got to trust in Jesus. Faith is not a work. Faith is a, it, it, faith is trusting in what Jesus did. So it's Jesus who saves us. The the kingdom manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount, is not something we do in order to be saved. What Jesus says is, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." He doesn't say you'll be blessed if you are poor in spirit. He's saying, no, if you are poor in spirit, you're blessed because you're in the kingdom. This is, this is the character of somebody who already lives in the kingdom. They've already been converted. They've already received the new birth. They've already been regenerated, changed. Their heart's been, the hard heart has been taken out. The stone of flesh has been inserted. The, 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 you know, the prophets, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, referred to that. The new covenant, take out the heart of stone, put in the heart of flesh. God's done all of this already, and this is the natural outflowing of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. This is how we will live. This is how we will conduct ourselves. So this is what you will do when you are saved. Starting in Matthew 7, 13, Jesus lays out four sections of teaching that serve as both warnings and calls to decision. Uh, so like I said in this chart, that just kind of helps you divide that up. You see, there's four individual warnings and they also are four calls to commitment all right so this is how jesus wraps up his sermon and uh so that's just to help you along with that and your further studies in the sermon of the mount um now uh he does this and he, he does this by contrasting there are two ways okay two responses to his words in verses 13 through 14 on here there's two ways in verses 15 through 20 there are two trees in 21 through 23 there's two claims and in 24 through 27 there are two builders now it is important just as a side note this is extremely important to understand that there is uh th there's a stress here that there are only two possible responses to jesus christ okay there's only two possible responses to Jesus. The first is that you enter the narrow gate, bear fruit as evidence of your conversion, truthfully experience intimacy with Jesus, and build your whole life upon his word. Or you enter through the broad way, bear no evidence of your conversion, falsely claim intimacy with Jesus, and build your life with no foundation. There's no middle ground in the gospel. There's no people that are partly there. There are no people that have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in darkness. You can't. Okay? Jesus calls for decision. Why? Because there's no middle ground in the gospel. There are no half measures with the king. He will have your all or he will have none. So much for an inclusive Jesus, huh? People want to believe that Jesus just accepts all comers, and he will for those who repent and believe. Those who repent from their works of sin, darkness, and the life that they used to live, and believe in what Christ has done for them. Those are those who will be born again, born from heaven, born from above, not according to the will of man, not according to flesh, but according to God and his glory and the power of the gospel, right? So how we respond to Jesus makes all the difference. We, all of our gospel presentations must bring people to a place of decision. We must bring people to the place where they're left before Jesus with you either accept him or reject him. You're either for him or against him. Choose this day whom you will serve. The point of Matthew 7 is that Jesus is calling us to respond to all that he has taught thus far in the Sermon on the Mount. So... Now, we're first going to look at what each builder has the same in the parable. First, both builders heard the words of Jesus and saw demonstrations of his power. If we would go back the whole way back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, we find out who is there for the entire sermon. Okay? This crowd is the same group who has come from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan, the scripture says. Now, this crowd is the same group in Matthew 4.23. They have seen Jesus, 
or they have heard Jesus teaching in the synagogues, preaching out in the streets about the kingdom of God. They have seen Jesus heal every disease, every reflection. And in Matthew 4, 24, it says that Jesus was casting out demons. And these people seen all of this taking place. Now they have just sat through the preaching of the greatest preacher who has ever lived. The, the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. They have been exposed to. The point is that every man, every woman, every child that has been following Jesus had been the recipient of God's unmerited favor. Every single one has seen the kingdom preached, taught, and demonstrated by Jesus Christ. There was no distinction made between people. Everybody got to hear the word of God, the words of Christ preached. There was no private sessions held where Jesus said, well, let's separate and I'll teach you guys this. And this is what I'll say to the rest of the group. Every person had the opportunity to hear the gracious words and see the power of Jesus. Each builder received the same measure of grace. None had an unfair advantage over the other. Each heard the same words and each had the same opportunity to respond to God's grace. All right? That's an important distinction to make. Every single one had the same opportunity. All right? We need to understand that every time the gospel is preached, the words of Christ go forth. Despite the imperfections of the preacher, despite the imperfections of the presentation, as far as it lines up with the word of God, it becomes the word of Christ to us. When you share your faith with somebody, when you share the gospel with somebody, Christ is speaking through you. That is evidence of God's grace. That's why it doesn't matter to me how people respond. I don't, you don't need to tell me, good job, Pastor. You don't need to tell me that was a good sermon. Or uh, That's not the point. The point is, is this event right here is the grace of God manifest to all of us. We get to hear the words of God. Whether we like them, whether we do, it doesn't matter. It's still God's grace being presented to us. So when next time you share your faith, remember, you are a citizen from God's kingdom. You are an ambassador giving the words of Christ to people. That is a wonderful calling. That is a privileged position. And when you share that, Christ meets you in your words to that person. And Christ is calling that person to either accept him or reject him. It is not your job to save people. It is not your job to regenerate anybody. It is not your job. It is your job just to be a good ambassador of Jesus Christ. You present that grace. You present that opportunity and leave the results up to God. Because salvation is God's work, not ours. Conversion is God's work. Conviction is God's work, not ours. Our responsibility is just to share the words. And those words, as we speak them, as we share, become the words of Christ. And these people get to hear the grace of God. Yes, we'd love to see everybody respond, but we know that's not going to happen. God has promised us it wouldn't happen. That's why there are two ways. The choice is up to the individual, and the saving work is up to God. We are just faithful stewards of God's gospel. Okay, So that's the first point. Is that G they, everybody's seen equally the words and the power and the demonstration of Jesus Christ. The second point of similarity between the two builders is that both builders had a home to build. Now... It's important for us to understand that Jesus is using the house as an analogy of our lives. What are we building our lives upon? Jesus just gave us his gracious and wise teachings. Are we building our lives upon his words? That's what he's asking them. I've just presented to you. Are you going to build your house on my teachings or are you not? Every one of us, irrespective of how much money we make, how intelligent we are, how attractive we are, how creative we are, whatever gifts and skills and talents we have, no matter you know, how we are socially or economically or any possible way, we are all building a house. We are all building on something. It doesn't happen in cruise control. We are making decisions. We are making choices. We are making commitments every single day that impact eternity. 
that impact eternity. C.S. Lewis uh, said in Mere Christianity that every single one of us, every decision we make, every single one, is turning the central part of who we are in one direction. It's either making us more of a heavenly being or it's making us more of a hellish being. Every choice is has eternal consequences. Every choice matters. Okay? So we have to understand that. In this technical age of information explosion, fast-paced living, uh, unprecedented prosperity, and the ability to travel far and wide, our choices are almost limitless. So the question is not, are we going to build, but what are we building upon? The question of each builder, is it the word of Christ or is it not? Is it the Google search bar? Is that where I go to for my information or do I go first to the word of God and say, God, what would you have me do? What is your desire? What is your plan? What is your will? So what are we building upon? Each had a home to build. Number three, both builders faced a storm. In that part of the world where Jesus is preaching, it is mostly desert. And it's, what's interesting is because everything shifts so often, you don't know where the old riverbeds were. You don't know where water normally travels whenever there's heavy rains. But for most of the year, it's dry, very little rain. And whenever the ground hits the sand, it, it just absorbs into the sand. Right? But in the winter, it drastically changes. The, the precipitation increases. They have crazy storms. Remember how the apostles were out in the boat and a storm came and it just it threatened the whole sea and it threatened the apostles. They thought they were going to die. And Jesus comes walking out on there. And there's the other occasion where he uh, said, The peace be still. Uh, you know, storms were common and frequent in Palestine. They were just hit with a fury. And in the winter, you would have these torrential downpours. A monsoon would come, and it would just water everywhere. Water would just fly everywhere. And what would happen is they would have so much water, it would carve channels down to the old bedrock, and you would see where the rivers were. And so what was interesting is you would build your house in the spring, and you would build, you would, you'd build a house, and you would think, oh, I just love my house. We got a house. We got protection. We got security. We got all of this, and it's, it's going to stand. I put a lot of effort into this. We made this. It's lasting. You wouldn't know until the storm hit if you placed it in a place where it's going to be knocked down. It was common in Jesus' day for that to happen. Um, think about this. You build a house in the spring and you wouldn't know um, unless you attach it to a secure foundation. It would, be, it would be obliterated by the winter floods. And this was common knowledge to everybody. All of Jesus' listeners, they would get the analogy. And uh, being a carpenter himself... I'm sure Jesus was well acquainted with this. How many homes do you think Jesus had to rebuild? Because somebody didn't build their house on a secure foundation. Right? So this was, this was an object lesson that Jesus would be familiar with, that the people would be familiar with. Right? And so the point is that he's making is that they were, they were used to this happening. They knew almost down to the day. I was down in Florida uh, years ago, about 12, 13 years ago uh, in Gainesville. And uh, we were staying with this lady and she said... Almost every day at 12 o'clock on a dot, it rains for half an hour. It's like, that's curious. And all, every day that we were there at 12 o'clock, bing, there, the rain would come. They could predict it. But she knew that. She had knowledge of that information. Why? Because she lives there. She's used to every day at 12 o'clock, it would rain. Every day at 1230, the clock would end. Like clockwork. Amazing. These people knew this. That in the winter, if your home was not on a secure foundation, your home would get swept away. It was like clockwork. It would happen. They knew it. The point that he's making is the storms will come to each builder. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Both builders, irrespective of what their life is built upon, regardless of how they respond to Jesus' preaching, a storm's going to come. It is often taught today, and falsely so, that once you accept Jesus, life will become better. You will have prosperity. Life will give, be a better roses. That everything will go our way when we receive Jesus. That is so contradictory to the Bible's message. The plain message of the Bible. That it can't even be considered a Christian teaching. It is a pagan heresy. It is not Christian. How many times I have sat with good Christians 
who for no fault of their own, no sin, watched a beloved family member suffer for a long time with some debilitating cancer or disease or something and die. Despite our prayers, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. How many Christians have deal with things like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. Brother Ron has a mild form of Parkinson's disease. Frank's wife has multiple sclerosis. My grandmother has so many autoimmune deficiency diseases and so many problems. Her fingers turn black this time of year. She wears gloves all day long because her fingers turn black, 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 like taking a permanent marker, black. She has Crohn's disease. She has all these things. My grandma is one of the godliest women that I know. I love my grandmother. She is a wonderful example of a, of a believer. Has been in my life. I wouldn't be a believer if it wasn't for her. Her prayers and her example have, God has used to powerfully affect. No, good Christians suffer bad things. All of us do. Storms will come. In my own life, I had to experience, I experienced the family of, uh, the loss of family through drug overdose. I lost two babies who were only a few months in conception. Long enough, the second one we had to have a, what do they call those, a DNA? Or what is it, not DNA, D a DA or what? I can't remember what they're called now. What's that? DNC, thank you very much. We had to do a DNC. I struggled for a year and a half dealing with that. I prayed, did God, did I sin? Did I do something wrong? Am I not a good enough Christian? Am I not praying enough? Am I not? I became a moralist and a legalist. And either way, it didn't matter. God is good regardless. When God's son was born, we thank God that he protected his one baby boy from Herod and his mercenaries who went out murdering children. But you notice, God only spared one child. He didn't spare the others. He only spared one. God didn't promise to save everybody out of every situation. Storms will come. God promises us that. And Jesus does not promise to help you win friends and influence people. He doesn't offer life with rose-colored lenses. Jesus promises that storms will come to every builder. His concern is what are you building on? Only if one foundation will withstand the storms. What are you building on? He's presenting them with the gospel. Why? So they can build a house that will stand when storms come. So we looked at the similarities between these two builders. It will do us well to look at the differences between these two builders. So the difference, the first thing we notice is the one builder was wise while the other was foolish. Since each builder heard and saw the same gracious words of Jesus Christ, it makes the distinctions of wise and foolish that much sharper. Jesus offered to his hearers a picture of the kingdom that embraces foolish or excuse me embraces love, truth, grace, wisdom, peace and mercy. No one could argue with Jesus that what he presented wasn't the best or better than the best possible life of meaning and purpose and dignity. Right? Jesus offered a nobody would argue with love being central to what life is all about. Nobody would who would Justice being a good thing. All these things that Jesus taught. But nobody would argue with Jesus that these were not good things. However, Jesus also knew the heart of man. There would be people. In fact, a majority of the people, according to the, the, the parable of the two ways, a majority of the people would be on a road that would deny Jesus. That would reject Jesus. They might pay lip service to Jesus as the one who says, Lord, Lord, but does not do what he says. But they will not serve under him as Lord. And there's only one type of person who can listen to the words, the gracious words of Jesus and respond that way. And that is foolish. A fool in the Bible is one who says there is no God. Despite the witness of nature, scripture, the law written on our hearts, reason, conscience, and even Christ himself. They could take all of that informa information in and still say that there is no God. In Romans 1, Paul says that it is not that they don't know God or they don't know that God exists, but they are suppressing the truth that they know about God and exchanging it for a lie. Um, <clears throat> it is not a head problem. Atheism is not a head problem. It's a heart problem. It's a moral problem. If God exists, then he is a rewarder of those who serve him and a punisher of those who don't. And so to silence the guilt that sin produces, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so um, he can eat, drink, and be merry to his or her little black's heart content. 
This is the one who hears and sees the works of Christ, but does not do them, according to Jesus. But there are those who hear and those who do. Those who hear and do are those who hear the gracious words of Christ and decide once and for all that this is where I belong. They embrace the narrow way, even though it's difficult, even though it's very difficult. We've got to put ourselves, you know, we, we, we die to ourselves. We say no to ourselves and it's difficult and it's painful and it's narrow. But we do it. Why? Because it's the road to Jesus. And we say, if this is the road to Jesus, this is the road I will take and no other. They are those who, because of their belief and faith in Christ, bear much fruit in their lives, imitating the one who purchased them. When they say, Lord, Lord, it is not lip service. It is the expression of an intimacy that really exists between that believer and Jesus Christ, that builder of the house and the Lord of the house. Uh, they, 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 they hear uh, when they're building their life, they build it upon the words of Christ in every area of life. I make my political decisions because of what the Bible says. I make my education decisions because of what the Bible says. I make my health decisions because of what the Bible says. I make my financial decisions because of what the Bible says. That's how they build their lives. And they, are, uh, and they take up their cross, they deny themselves, and they embrace the way of Jesus no matter the cost. This is the character of the wise builder according to the gospel, according to Jesus, according to his words. The second point of contrast is that one built on a foundation while the other did not. Right? It's not a matter of foundation. It's not a matter of different foundations. One dug down deep and built a foundation. The other didn't. He built it on sand. Okay? The one, his priority was for permanency. He wanted to dig down and dig hard and hit the rock. The other one was more worried about expediency, what's easiest, what's quickest, and what is the one that will get the job done. And he just wants to build quickly. Now, I want to speculate a little bit here. Um, or maybe I better wait till the next point. Yeah, I'll wait till the next point for that. <laughs> uh, I, I write outlines and all this stuff and sermons and, and whether I stick to them or not. Uh, I like to jump ahead sometimes. Uh, but the foundation that here is alluded to are the words of Christ. They are the foundation, the building block upon which a house can stand. Jesus' words, which we can say the entire Bible, are the words of Jesus. Because Jesus is the, self, he's the word of God. He's the self-expression of God. When God speaks, it is Jesus he speaks. And so... The whole Bible is what we're talking about. The Bible is the only source of divinely revealed wisdom and truth. They are trustworthy and true because their author is trustworthy and true. Right? Uh, Christ offers us uh, various and precious promises. And when you offer somebody a promise, it's because you intend to keep your word. Jesus offers us promises because he intends to keep them. He has the power. He has the compassion. He has the drive. He has the desire. He has the zeal. He wants to accomplish his word in our lives. He's eager to grant you all the promises that he affords. He will always come through. The foolish builder is the one who takes no heat of foundation and haphazardly builds upon the shifting sands. And that's the end of the matter. They hear Jesus' words and they say, oh, that, that's great. Oh, Jesus, you're such a wonderful teacher. I love to hear your sermons. I think you're a great guy. But that's where it ends. It ends in the head. It never penetrates to the heart. It just ends in the head. It doesn't result in life transformation in a life different than the one before a life that lives in conformity to the revealed will of God. Hearing does not result in doing so they're building if they if they deny divine revelation, what's left the shifting sands of man's wisdom. Man's wisdom is limited, shallow, self-centered and ever changing. It is amazing to me that we put any stock, or very much stock, in human wisdom. We laugh at the people who come before us saying that they were silly, unenlightened, and uh, just weren't very intelligent. We say, how could anyone have ever believed that? But we need to stop and think, what will the future generations think about us? What will they be laughing about? Oh, they believe that? Every generation thinks that they are the elite, that they are the ones who have made it, that they have somehow arrived. And yet we look back upon those in the past as foolish, quaint, less intelligent, and even we feel a little bit of pity for them. How could we be so foolish? 
Human wisdom changes with every generation. The foolish builder is a fool precisely because he rejects the foundation of Christ's word and instead builds upon the shifting sand of man's opinion. But the wise builder is not so. He is wise precisely because he builds his life upon the firm rock of Christ's words. He hears the words of Christ and says, these are the words of life. Here is wisdom. I must obey. I can do no other. It's like when Jesus told the apostles, he had, he had all these crowds following him uh, in John chapter 6. And Jesus preached a very hard sermon, a very hard, difficult truth for the people to accept on the sovereignty of God and how man is completely incapable of coming to God apart from Jesus Christ. The car, apart from, no one can come to Christ apart from the drawing of Jesus Christ. Right. And he said that you have to eat my blood. You have to drink my you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people just could not grasp it. And everybody decided to leave. Save the apostles. And he says, what about you? Are you going to leave too? And they say, where will we go? You have the words of life. Of course, they were as confused as everybody else. Of course, it was difficult for them to accept as everybody else. But they could not leave. Something compelled them. You have the words of life. You and you alone, where else can I go? The disciple of Jesus says, I don't care how hard it is and how difficult it is and how hard it challenges me. I will accept it because it is your truth. You show me wisdom. You show me what to believe. The builder is the one who sees in Christ's words a shelter in the storm. The builder sees in the words of Christ the truth that does not change the life that we were meant to live. The builder willingly and lovingly embraces Christ as Savior, repents from all that offends God, pursues peace with all men, and the holiness that without which no man shall see the Lord. This builder sees in Christ's words the only permanent place of security, stability, and substance in a world of insecurity, instability, and lack of anything substantial. This builder sees in Christ's words the pearl of great price that is worthy of the selling of all his possessions in order to obtain. And this, is, and this one has all the reason in the world to trust in and depend upon his promises. Why? Because the author is faithful and true and a sure hope in a world of uncertainty. This is what makes him wise. The final point of difference between our two builders is this. One endured the storm while the other came to ruin. Now here's where I get to speculate a little bit. It's possible that the house built on the sand could have been an elegant one, more beautiful than the one built on the rock. Okay, now just run with me for a little bit. We have nothing in the text that says this, but just let, let a foolish preacher, you know, run his train of thought. Imagine that the house that was built on the sand, because think about it, if you don't have to build a foundation, you don't have to buy brick and mortar, you don't have to buy, you don't have to lay a foundation, you don't have to dig, you don't got to pay the guy to come dig. Right? You can start building right away. So all the money you put in the foundation, you can put into the home to make it nicer. Maybe he had a beautiful, big Victorian home. You could see, uh, you know, big, those big Colosseum things out in the front holding the porch roof up. Those big, gorgeous, just big, beautiful porches. I mean, this is a fantastic house, right? Gorgeous, big, beautiful windows. You could look through the windows and see beautiful chandeliers hanging inside. You see them having fancy leather furniture, the big sectionals that every seat pops out into a recliner with cup, you know, cup holders in it and giant big screen TV, you know, beautiful house, beautiful things inside and everything. It made you kind of envy when you walk down past and you see the guy who built the, the house on the rock because he spent so much time building on the rock. Maybe he didn't, maybe he, because he, he, he spent so much time on the foundation, maybe all he could afford was a 1970 tin can trailer and he put it on that rock and fastened that rock and it had a bent little antenna on the top of it because that's all he could afford, Right. He only had a little black and white TV, 13 inch. They even make those anymore. <laughs> uh, but they, he, you know, who knows? Who knows? I'm just speculating. But does that matter? Does it matter the size of the home and how beautiful and how elegant and how? No, it's the foundation. The foundation is what matters in the parable, in the story. When Jesus calls us to this place of decision, because the storms will come. And it doesn't matter how beautiful your home is. It isn't the, it isn't the external things that matter. And it doesn't even matter you know, where it's located. It's what it is located on in the parable that matters. Is it fixed to the rock? It doesn't matter how much you spend on it. It doesn't matter how beautiful it is because storms will come. This tin can trailer could not be moved 
because it's founded, it's attached to the rock. And the strength of the tin can trailer is not in itself. It's on the rock that it rests on. The man who builds his house on the sand, it doesn't matter. It could be Fort Knox, but because there is no foundation, it gets pushed over. It gets knocked over. It gets pushed away. Because it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't depend. Or, it's firmly fixed to the immovable rock. It doesn't matter. Anything else, it doesn't matter how beautiful, it doesn't matter how big, it's the rock, the foundation that matters. Friends, it doesn't matter what your life looks like on the outside. The gospel is not only for the prettiest, the smartest, the most creative, the most together among us. No, the gospel is for sinners, for the least of these, for the poor in spirit, for those who don't have it together. It doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't depend on how together you are. In the final analysis, what matters is what are you building your life upon? Storms are God's way of testing our foundation. In the spring, there is no discernible difference between the two homes. It was the winter storms that provided the distinction. We wonder at trials and tribulations that come into our lives. We plead with God and ask Him why. Sometimes we even shake our fists at God in the heavens and demand an answer for our trouble. But God has already given us His answer. He allows trials and tribulations to come in order to reveal what your life is built upon. It's an act of grace. There is subtle difference between the action of the storm upon the two houses. There's, there's a distinction made. In both cases, the same words are used except for a little subtle difference. In the case of the wise builder, the ESV says the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. In the case of the foolish builder, it says the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Did you catch the distinction? On and against. On and against. What's the difference? This means, okay, for the, for, for the first house, the word on. The picture that it gives us is that the tin can trailer, the, the house that was built on the rock, it weathered the full fury of the storm. The storm exhausted itself on the house. It blew against, it blew on that house, it beat against that house. It could not shake the house because the house was fixed to the foundation, to the rock, and the rock could not be moved by the storm, so the house could not be moved by the storm. The second house, the wind blew against it. It's a weaker word in the Greek. Okay, it means that at the very moment the storm began with the first winds that picked up it knocked the house right over kablooey Knocked it completely over It didn't even last two minutes into the storm and it was already knocked down Okay, and Jesus goes on to say great was its fall the idea is complete ruin gone forever the wind and the, the rain completely just remove the house. It's gone. You, you cannot get it back. The builder is completely ruined. It's a total loss to the builder. The point is that trials and tribulations reveal what we are building upon. The foolish builder who builds upon the shifting sand of man's wisdom cannot endure even the beginning of trouble. As soon as the storm picks up, oh no, where I'm falling apart in my life, I can't handle this. When hardships, when hardships call, come, they fall apart. They cannot patiently endure any trouble because they have nothing enduring to stand upon. Somebody who says, oh, you know, my boyfriend left me. I, can't, I just can't handle life. I just, oh my God, I just, how am I going to get through this? Needs to stop and ask themselves, am I rooted on the rock? Because if Christ is my rock, my life will not fall apart. If I put all of my faith and the, my hope and my happiness and my joy in a relationship and that relationship fails, I will fall apart. That is man's wisdom. God's wisdom doesn't do so. The wisdom of man can't even meet the most fundamental of human needs and so can offer no help when trouble comes. But the wise builder, because he is found on the rock, no storm can take him down. Did you notice that? That's a promise from Jesus. Doesn't matter how hard the storm comes in, it can blow and it can beat and it can give its full fury and it's not going to move. And that, that house is not going to be torn down. Why? Because it's founded on Jesus. It's founded on the rock. Nothing can shake it because nothing is stronger than Jesus. Jesus said, nothing can take you out of my hand. No one can snatch us from Jesus. Who are those who conquer? Those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing, nothing. 
It's not the size or the strength of the house that gives stability to the house, but the qualities of the rock that matter. Though the believer does not particularly enjoy the trouble that comes, the Bible, you know, there's only one place where we're said, in, you know, rejoice whenever trials come your way. And it doesn't mean jump around, clap your hands, and, oh, I'm so happy, 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 happy. I broke my leg. My car blew up. Yay. No, that's not the idea. He doesn't say to rejoice because of the trial. He says rejoice. Why? Because God is doing this for your growth. Rejoice in what God is doing in your life, not in the trouble. That's what he's calling us to do. Okay? But even though we don't enjoy the trouble that comes, he or she knows that they will come through victorious. Why? Because we serve a victorious Savior in Jesus Christ. He will lead us through victorious. We will triumph over. He never takes us around the Red Seas of our lives. He takes us through, right through the center. But He leads us and He guides us. He protects us. He helps us. He, but He brings us through the Red Sea. Not around. Through. That's how God works. And the source of their confidence is they know that God has promised to see them through. He guarantees it in His Word. Now, uh, I just have here uh, seven points of application. I have adapted these from Matthew Henry's commentary. Uh, <clears throat> there's, he called them seven lessons that we learn. Um, and I turned them into seven points of application and just tweaked everything a little bit. Um, seven things we learn. And these are on your uh, hand out there. Um, every one of us has a house to build. Okay? Every one of us has decisions to make. And every choice we bear has eternal consequences. We need to ask ourselves, what am I building on? Number two, there is a rock to build upon. That's a good thing. God has graciously provided me with the gospel to build upon. We have Christ and his words to build our lives upon. That is a wonderful grace from God. We need to build it. That's the rock that God has given us. The elect of God build their home upon the rock. The elect are just the people of God. The elect of God build their hope upon the rock. 2 Peter 1.10 says to be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. He is referring to self-examination. We need to constantly scrutinize ourselves and ask ourselves, Am I certain that I am building my hope upon the rock? Have I repented and trusted in Christ alone for my salvation? Am I bearing fruit, the evidence of conversion? Am I taking up my cross? Uh, and practicing self-denial? Am I pursuing peace with all men and practicing holiness? Do I love God? Do I love others? The reason for this, Peter goes on to say later on, is that it instills hope into us. When we can look at these questions square in the face and answer yes, affirmatively, to each and every one, we have a confident assurance. We of all people have a hope that cannot be shaken. Why? Because I am in Christ Jesus and nothing can shake me. Number four, there are many building upon the sand. Jesus said many were on the easy path that leads to destruction in Matthew 7, 13. Am I certain that the shifting sands of man's wisdom are not my ultimate secure authority? Where do I go for wisdom? The Google search bar or do I go to the Bible? Right? That's our question. Where are we going to first as our ultimate authority, as our litmus test for truth? And we need to go to those that we love and share with them the gospel because they are building their lives on shifting sands. Number five, there are storms coming that will try every man's work. Okay? These storms are twofold. Firstly, they are the everyday trials, tribulations, and temptations that are common to everyone. They will come. Jesus promises us these storms will come. But there is also a final judgment that, reve that will reveal the foundations we are building our lives upon. Only one foundation will endure Jesus' coming to judge. And that is Jesus himself. And the other foundation will be swept aside. In the end, we will learn things. Things will be revealed. Remember what Jesus said, nothing remains hidden. All things will be revealed. Jesus said, even the idle words that we speak, that is when the person cuts me off, you know, in the busy four-lane highway, and I yell, you idiot, you moron. Jesus says, ah, 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 that's an idle word. We will stand before him on judgment day to account for those, those words. Okay? <laughs> So, we, there, are, there are storms coming. Number six, those who build upon the rock will stand. There is a promise to the elect of God in this text. Those who build upon the rock of Christ's words will endure the storm. Their strength is not their own. Their strength is in Christ Jesus. Number seven, any foundation other than Christ will fall. That's why we need to share with all of our loved ones the gospel as often as we can and do as the Apostle, says, Apostle Paul says and don't grow weary in doing good. Why? Because if we grow weary in doing good, uh, that's just one more opportunity that the enemy has and that we have lost when we don't share the gospel. 
People need to build their lives in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now to the conclusion, just to end this sermon. I should say that's a meaningless statement that every preacher makes. Why? Because the Apostle Paul, halfway through some of his letters, will say, and to, basically to conclude, and then he gives us like four more chapters. And so see, it's biblically, biblically warranted. So, <laughs> uh, so to conclude, when we say, I believe in the Apostles' Creed, it would be catastrophic to be merely play, paying lip service. When a Christian says, I believe, that belief should be both understood and practiced. Belief is the content side of faith, and faith, faith is the action side of belief. Or Orthodoxy, or right belief, must be complemented with orthopraxy, or right practice. Belief without action is useless. Faith without content is dangerous. Now, I would like to add this from uh, author Matt Woodley uh, in this neat little commentary I have of his on the Gospel of Matthew. He says, Jesus believed in making, making a decision. As Jesus concludes his powerful kingdom manifesto, he delivers the same message. You have to decide to follow me, or you must decide not to follow me. After that, the rest of your life will get done. It's not an easy message. Jesus calls for a clean-cut, uncompromising, life-altering, permanent, ongoing decision to follow him by listening to and then obeying his words. There is no other way. Jesus wasn't soft about this need for an unyielding and ongoing decision. Jesus emphasizes the same theme four times in a row. Decide for me or against, uh, or against. Decide to be with me or apart from me. Decide to be my apprentice or someone else's apprentice. Or, as Bob Dylan railed, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but it's going to be somebody. You can't drift into following Jesus. So today, Jesus calls us to look, to examine our foundations. Are we following him or are we not? If we aren't, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of decision. Call upon Jesus and you will find him a perfect Savior. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful.